Well, starting right at verse 1 here. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters. While the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. We learn here that Esther is on day three of her fast. We learn that she went into a fast last week in last week's text, and she actually asked everyone to go into a fast that Mordecai could spread the word to. Mordecai being her father via adoption. He's really her older cousin, and this is all the family they have left. She has spent the last three days likely in sackcloth like her father, Mordecai. And while the text does not say that she prayed, all right, and I emphasized this last week, that God normally, when people fast and they are in repenting in sackcloth and ashes, God is usually clear that they also are doing this in order to pray. But he did not mention that last week with Mordecai repenting in sackcloth and ashes in their fast, nor Esther. And I think this is a grave mistake upon from Mordecai and Esther, though... Given that, I'm sure they did do at least some praying. It was not the preeminent reason by which they fasted, which it should have been, but even pagans during times as miserable and desperate as this usually pray. Even unbelievers, when they know that their entire entire people group are about to be annihilated and they're one of them, they usually pray. And so I do think they spent at least some of the time in prayer, though I don't think it was an oversight by God that he purposely did not put prayer in the text because I really do think due to their sin, due to their sinful habits and patterns, their almost entire enculturation into pagan Persian living led them to a rather prayerless life. Continuing, we do see though last week that they did trust at some measure in the providence of the sovereign God. They were failing to recognize the loving fatherhood of God and the reality that God works out his will through the prayers of his people. The Lord determines not only the conclusions of this whole grand story of reality, but also he determines the means by which he will bring about those conclusions. We know from his word, he's revealed it plainly to us that prayer is one of the primary means by which God brings about all of his plans. And here she is on her third day, her third day of fasting. She is, as we often say when we miss just lunch, starving. She likely does not feel remotely close to her normal self between the hunger, three days into fasting, And the nerves, knowing that what she's about to do might lead to her death. We know already that it was a law that anyone who enters the king's palace, his court, without being requested, will die. Unless the king mercifully puts out his golden scepter for them to take. Make no mistake, Esther knows she may be in the final minutes of her life. We can't just pass this by. She might be in the final minutes of her life. This is Russian roulette to the max, except even worse. Because as I argued last week, this is probably at best a 50-50 chance of survival. Imagine for a moment that you were put into a situation knowing that within the next 15 minutes, by the flip of a coin, you will live or die. By the flip of the coin, you will live or you will die. Even worse than a coin, really, the king is a hothead. He's a drunk. Esther hasn't seen him in 30 days, the text said last week. There's almost a 0% chance he has been maritally faithful to his wife alone, knowing the character of this man, what we've learned so far five chapters in. And just to remind everyone, the only reason Esther is even his wife is because his previous wife, Vashti, as we learn in chapter 1, said no to one of his requests 
And as far as we could discern, it was a pretty garbage request to begin with. One no, and he divorced her. And God's word said in the text that they never saw each other again. He then proceeds a multi-year-long search for a wife, which involves kidnapping women from throughout the entire empire, endless vanity and sexual morality to the max. It has been years since that beauty pageant concluded, and Esther doesn't even see her husband that regularly. In fact, it seems from the preceding chapters that she lives in a different house than her husband. She can easily go 30 days, as we see here, without even seeing him. I don't know about you, but this does not sound like a particularly healthy marriage. Add in the fact that Esther is only risking her life because the king was bribed into committing genocide against the entire Jewish people, and he was bribed with ease. There was very little to no resistance when Haman offered some coin, some silver, for the entire Jewish people, all of God's people at this time, to be, as the text said, killed, destroyed, and annihilated. All in one day. And we know from that text that he concluded the night that he was bribed after giving his approval, his hearty yes and amen to Haman, with just a relaxing drink. Considering all this, you can see why my 50-50 chance of Esther dying is actually extremely generous to the king. With more sobriety, one could easily argue that Esther is most certainly going to die when she defies the king's edict, which again is that no one can enter his court unless they are first requested. And she has not been requested. Now, I've spoken much of the sin of Esther and Mordecai throughout the book thus far, I think rightly so. That's what we've seen so far, just this gradual, continual faithfulness to pagan Persian culture away from the culture of God's kingdom, away from the culture God established in the law and the prophets. The gospel that God had promised to them even now at this point. They are, of course, in Susa, the capital city, bucking against the prophets who came to them and told them to go back to Jerusalem for decades at this point. And here they are. And so we've talked much of their sin, but we must give honor where honor is due. And there's a reversal taking place, a mighty reversal. We recognize that God is providentially working all of this out, every detail of this story for the good of his people and his own glory. And he is therefore due the true honor. But by God's grace, Esther is also acting very honorably here. She has transitioned in really a short time from passive, vain, rather heartless, a faithless woman, comfortably married to an uncircumcised evil pagan king, to a woman who in some regard, just citing some of Proverbs 31, laughs at the days to come who puts out her hand to the needy. Strength and dignity seem to be her clothing at this point. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She isn't eating the bread of idleness anymore. Many women of the kingdom would do excellently in her shoes, assumingly, but in the providence of God, as we see in our text, she really does surpass them all. We see even in our text that the heart of her husband trusts in her. Now, may this be an immense encouragement to all the women here. The world would have you, women, live such a pathetic and sinful life if you go according to their gospels and their laws, that by the time you fit their mold, by the time you have actually won them over, gained their approval, you have become a faithful disciple of them, you won't even be a woman anymore. You won't stand for femininity. You will be fruitless and enslaved to vain glory. And if this is you, even this very day, today is the day of salvation from these vain pursuits. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. 
Our God is merciful beyond measure. His mercies are new each morning, including this very morning. You no longer have to live in sin. You no longer have to be enslaved to whatever it is you might be enslaved to. You no longer have to hide your godliness, your faith in Christ, your association with the lowly and the pitied, which in our day is fastly becoming just an association with a biblical Christian church and the Christians therein. You no longer have to give off the appearance of strength, but rather you can be truly strong in the Lord, clothed in dignity. You don't have to be enslaved to food or the approval of man, idleness, immoral dress, or any kind of foolishness at all. His mercies are new, and they are offered this day. Esther was, by nearly all measurements, a faithless woman who had completely given herself to pagan Persian culture up to this point in the story. But no more. But no more. Now, broadening this to everyone at this point, male and female, Esther didn't even draw out her repentance over weeks or months, years or decades. Listen, it is a total lie. It is a total lie that somehow gets perpetuated in the church of the living God that you have to slow play repentance. That you can't just repent of sin today. That whatever sin you did this week can be the last time you did that sin. Whatever sin you're aware of, that you know I shouldn't have done it this week, His mercies are new this morning. There's a lie that says, as long as you can make it three weeks, that's good. Or six months, or one year, or whatever it might be. And it's all a lie. You can repent. You can put the sin to death and never go and resurrect it again. Let it die there. And you don't have to wait weeks or months or years. You don't need to slow play repentance. Perhaps, as we see in the text, you need to fast for three days. And I mean that. Perhaps you do. But you can be done with your sin this week. Trust me, when you repent of your, let's just say, more egregious sins that you know you should have mastered a long time ago, don't worry. You will learn of more sin in your life. Don't fear that you may actually achieve sinless perfectionism if you repent of all the sin you're aware of this week. By the time you do that, and you put all that sin to death, you will wake up and you will realize, I still need Christ. In fact, I need him more than I ever realized because I've actually repented of all these sins I was aware of, and here I am sinning in ways I didn't even see before. Do not fear that if you repent of all the sins that you're aware of, sins that perhaps you've confessed in gospel groups or with brothers and sisters for weeks, if this this is the last time you ever did it, whenever it was, three days ago, one week, three months, that you are now going to be sinless. Just put the sin to death. Jesus has to do it with violence. Tear out your eye. Cut off your hand you will still wake up a sinner the next day. And his grace will be there. His mercy is new. But you will be more sanctified. You will be immensely more sanctified, more readily able to be a good tool in the hands of our king. You can still repent of all the sin you're aware of, and you can do it a lot quicker than you think. You can do it a lot quicker than you think. Speaking more to fasting... If you have been struggling with the same sin for months or even years, listen, you should fast. You should fast. Most of our sins pertain to our bodies. We have some physical urge for something sinful, and we don't have the maturity and bodily discipline to tell our bodies no and move on to good and godly things. Fasting is an amazing way to grow that ability, the ability to tell your body what it's telling you, your fleshly sinful desires, to just say no. Your body will be telling you with urges, feelings, aches, and pains even that you must do this thing. And if you fast, it'll be telling you you should eat. 
which eating is, of course, a good thing. But during a fast, you are growing mastery over your body for some other intended purpose. We don't just fast in the Christian life just to do it or just for weight loss. We do it to gain mastery over our body and to seek the Lord in prayer with our extra time. I think you'll be wildly surprised, or anyone who has fasted will be wildly surprised how much of your day you actually spend thinking about food, deciding what food you want, getting the food, preparing the food, and then cleaning up after the food. If you were to just take one meal time and devote that time to prayer, you will be surprised with how much time you have. We fast typically for a conclusion that actually has little to do with the fast itself. The fasting is just the tool to get to a different conclusion. God has given us fasting as an amazing tool to accomplish many ends, to reach many good conclusions. So men and women, if you have a sin that is hanging longer than it should upon you, based on today's text, fast. Fast for one day, two days, three days, even more if necessary. Be wise knowing your schedule and your own bodies and what you can handle. But I'm only aware of one person in my life, and all the Christians I've met, who's even come close to passing out because they fasted too long. I'm only aware of one. Most of us are in the camp where if we skip one lunch, we think we're going to die. And you're not. But our sin will kill us. Our sin will kill us. We're usually not willing to give up a workout or something else that we know we should eat before or after for 42 hours or 72 hours to focus on the fast. People have asked, and it is all by grace, so please don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, but people have asked, how did I grow in spiritual maturity at the rate I did? And, and it is just grace upon grace. Do not, it is nothing in me, but the tools God gave me, I actually did fast a lot in those first couple years. People often ask that question, especially once they know just how pathetic I really was, and still am. And though I still have a long way to go, of course, the answer to my growth is really nothing spectacular. I read the Bible a lot those first two years and just tried to take God at his word. I fasted pretty often those two years, including one three-day fast. I prayed for wisdom and repentance constantly and bound myself to accountability for sin. I beat my body and mastered its fleshly impulses through these simple means. This is supposed to be an immense encouragement. These are just simple means by which God has given all of us to mature and to grow and to be sanctified. They are graces for us all. All of my growth and anyone else's is by grace. But grace is not just some ethereal thing. It's not just some eschatological thing that we will eventually get. Grace comes to us in real practical ways each and every day. And unfortunately, we often reject these graces and subsequently fail to grow as we should in the Lord. The text doesn't say exactly what caused such a dramatic reversal in Esther's life. It doesn't say it. But what the text does say, we know from other biblical texts, are the very means by which God brings about great repentance and redemption. Fasting is what we see Esther do. She repents. She has a new humility. She seeks accountability. She meditates on the brevity of her life per the recommendation of her father. Remember, he says, you're going to die either way, Esther. She takes ownership and responsibility. She abstains from the vain distractions in her life, at least for during the time of fasting. These are all the things that we have seen in last week's text and this week's text take place in the lives of Mordecai and Esther. And the fruits are immense. The fruits are really astonishing. Last week left off with a girl who was crippled by the fear of death to such a degree she failed to see that she would die no matter what because Haman's plans would either be brought to fruition and she herself is a Jew, so all the Jews will be killed, destroyed, and annihilated. That's what the edict said. And she failed to see this. She thought she could preserve her own life 
and watch her people die. In humility and courage, though, she boldly resolved to risk her life, to repent of her selfishness, and to fast in preparation for three days. She mastered her body, and she took the first steps of her plan in our text. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters with the king while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, and the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you, even to half my kingdom. Stop there. Success. Success. She wisely dresses in her royal robes. She isn't having a pity party, though she is probably very hungry and not feeling well. She enters the king's court, but doesn't strut her way up to the king and make any demands. She humbly walks enough to be noticed. She walks into the court enough to be noticed, yet stops and then waits for his decision from a distance. Put it simply, she's showing us humility and meekness, but also great courage. Her life was spared. She won the favor of the king, the text says. She received it. He stuck out the golden scepter, and she received the scepter. And the king actually offers her even more favor. Right off the bat, without even a request being known, he offers her half his kingdom. Half his kingdom. And anything else she wants, just up to half his kingdom. Let me ask you. This is a pretty tempting offer. She could go to a plan B here. Half the kingdom. Pretty good. Do you think she would have stuck to the plan if she hadn't first mastered her flesh through fasting? Do you think she would have stuck to the plan? She has a plan. We learn of it in the next few verses. Do you think she would have stuck to the plan if she had taken a few shots of alcohol before she went into the king's court? Would she have stuck to the plan if she was actually unrepentant and really aiming to only meet her selfish desires? This is no small offer. Half the Persian empire, the largest empire in the world at this time. Sure, she is a Jew, but if she receives half the empire by the king's own edict, her life will probably be spared, even assuming Haman's plan gets brought to fruition. <clears throat> and she could probably even spare the lives of at least some at that point. If not all the Jews, perhaps her half of the kingdom, she could say Haman's edict cannot be brought to fruition. This is my half of the kingdom now. But she doesn't take the bait. Half the kingdom isn't enough. In fact, it's not even what she wants. It's not why she's there. God has a far great and nobler plan for her. You see, when we don't stand on principle, on absolute principle, where God has spoken absolutely, of course, like standing up for all God's people, in this example in Esther, we will fall for many temptations, often the temptation of incremental improvement. I think to the genocide in our own land in the light of this story so far. All the Jews will be annihilated soon according to Haman's plan. It's an edict. It's a day. It's been established. It's coming. And Esther is here by God's providence to thwart that plan if God allows. She was just offered half the kingdom, but she doesn't take the bait. She doesn't settle with an incremental win. She doesn't settle with potentially some Jews, perhaps even half of them being spared. She stands on a righteous principle and sticks to her plan so that all of God's people may be spared. This made me think to the laws that many pro-lifers actually praise in our country that are not principled law. Laws that really only spare a small portion of the people being slaughtered. They only reduce the genocide in our land to a smaller number instead of abolish it altogether. The large majority of abortions take place in our country before 12 weeks in the womb, 
which is why there's many, many abortion mills in San Diego County who offer drugs to kill a child who is less than 12 weeks old in the womb, but there's only one abortion mill in the county that does surgical abortions after 12 weeks, which is when they are required. Much demand for prior to 12 weeks, and I mean much demand enough that there's one three to four week out scheduled surgical abortion place, but not enough to build more of them. Praise God. So most of the demand is for younger children, newly conceived children, children from zero to 12 weeks. Yet legislatures willingly reject laws that actually abolish abortion altogether, and supposedly pro-life Christians and politicians and so on approve of bills and movements that still allow many children to be slaughtered. They pat themselves on the back, we pat ourselves on the back, and consider ourselves standing on some righteous principle, then in reality, when in reality their morality is like a shifting sand. It is morally wrong every single time to kill a child. It doesn't matter if a woman was raped or the child was conceived in incest. We do not kill one of the innocent persons in that situation based on the sins of another person in the situation. Oftentimes, child, the child is the only truly innocent person in this horrible situation, and yet we think it should be a law, a caveat at least in the law, that says, let's just kill the child and move on. The only innocent person, or at best, one of two innocent parties, the mom and the child. Neither of them should die based on the sins of another. In this, most cases, the sins of the father. This isn't difficult logic to track with, but many of us have bit the incremental offer. The baby is a blessing no matter how the baby was conceived, and they can either be adopted or raised redemptively by the mom and or dad, depending on the situation. Therefore, we cannot be okay with six-week heartbeat bills, especially if they have caveats for rape or incest. They are good insofar, don't misunderstand me, they have some measure of goodness insofar as they preserve half the kingdom, perhaps, but they are vile insofar as they still allow an untold number of children to be slaughtered legally based upon the sins of another person, sins the child did not commit. We are invoking the death penalty upon the innocent child for the sins and criminal acts of another person. I mean, Justice 101 says something's seriously wrong here. Humans are body and soul, and both soul and body are given to us at conception. There are differences between a five-year-old out of the womb and a one-week-old in the womb. What are these differences? Size, location, Education, dependence, these things vary depending on the age of the child. Both of the children, though, are real children, given body and soul. Both are real children. They just vary in size, location, education, independence, and development. Make no mistake, though, neither the five-year-old outside the womb or the newly conceived one-day-old in the womb are fully developed. Neither will survive on their own. Leave the five-year-old out in the street and see how long they last. Neither are fully educated. And both are to be protected where they are, in whatever location they are. In fact, the womb is designed by God to be one of the safest places on the planet, yet we have made it one of the most dangerous through corrupt government and a lawless people who do what is right in their own eyes. Esther here is offered half the kingdom. Her life was very likely going to be spared at this point. She can get out of the whole situation so far, take the bait, half the kingdom sounds great, preserve the Jews in my half, and let's move on. I'm sure she wants to get out of this whole nightmare very quickly. And yet she perseveres past the temptation. Half the kingdom isn't enough. Half the kingdom isn't what she came here for. Many would have taken the demonic bait of half the kingdom. And that's assuming they even made it this far in the truly life-threatening challenge. Remember the flip of the coin, although it's worse. 
She doesn't take the bait, though. Verses, starting at verse 4, we learn what she does. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. What is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Esther, by the providence and grace of God, with the entire Jewish people hanging in the balance, perseveres. She shrewdly sticks to her plan, the one she concocted before in her three-day fast. We know it was a previous plan because she has already prepared the feast. It's done. She's just inviting them to come. She is resolved for good. She is displaying great emotional control. She is being innocent as a dove, yet wise as a serpent, waiting, patiently waiting for the opportune time to strike. The king obliges to her hospitality. Hospitality, church, is another means, another tool by which God wins the hearts of fools like you and I. The hearts of the lost, of sinners, and even unifies a people. Before they're redeemed in him and after they're redeemed in him, he unifies people through a very simple means called hospitality. Hospitality flows directly from the character of God. God has made it clear that in his house are many rooms that he has prepared for us. In Luke 14, Jesus tells a great, a story of a great banquet <clears throat> that a man was hosting. And he sent invites to many, and many people come back and they make excuses about why they cannot attend the banquet. And so God, with a great desire to fill his house, God being the man in this story, tells his servants to go and tell the lame and the crippled and the blind to come to the banquet. And the servants do this. And yet they come back and they say, they've all come, but there's still more room. And God is not satisfied. He wants every room filled. In verse 23, the Lord, Jesus Christ telling a story, says this. The master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. End quote. How kind, wonderful, glorious, hospitable, loving, joyous is our God. This story is, of course, speaking to salvation preeminently, but the very wedding feast will take place. This banquet will come to fruition. People often think heaven is going to be nothing like this life. They think it's going to be something ethereal or in some magical way very different, but usually in a lesser way. But this is not true. Make no mistake, morally it will be cosmically different. It will be sinless, for all will be holy as God is holy. But we will, as we do here, feast and laugh and drink and play and work and rest, but without pain, tears, agony, sickness, death, and toil. Now, I bring all this up for a purpose, because I do think the feast that Esther invites them to is one of the main reasons why the plan works. She's not just picking something random to do. She's using, again, another one of God's tools, hospitality, to win the hearts of the king. And God has given Esther great wisdom here. To use not just the general gift that hospitality is to us all, but in particular as a woman. Her hospitality is one of the main tools for righteous soul winning. Give it to her. If you need an example to a, a woman's gifting towards hospitality and amends, all right? If you come to the brotherhood, it's a joke how inhospitable it is. <laughs> and you go to the women's brunch, and who doesn't want to go to that party? Women are naturally gifted in this. And Esther uses this wisely, shrewdly. She doesn't buck at the giftings of God that he has given her in her glorious femininity. She uses them. Many women here might have tried to just seduce the king into giving and granting her wish. But Esther is righteous here, working diligently for the preservation of God's people by the will of God. So she uses her God-given giftings to host an incredible feast, and it all went wonderfully. 
After the feast, as they were drinking wine, the king asked Esther for a second time what she really wants. Now, the king is a fool. We've learned this, but he's, he has knowledge. He's not a complete idiot. He knows that Esther risked her very life when she came into his courts without being requested. He knows she would not do this flippantly. He knows there's something really important that she wants. He desires to know, and even preemptively offers Esther whatever she wishes up to half his own kingdom. Do remember that Haman only offered the king half of a year's tax revenue up front. So for Esther to ask for a reversal of Haman's offer and just receive half the kingdom is actually a great bargain for the king. It's a lot less expensive for the king to offer uh, to get rid of Haman's offer and give half the kingdom to Esther. She could, she could make a smaller bargain here. If she's being offered half the kingdom, she could just offer even less or more than Haman, depending on what she thinks is best. Point being, she has the upper hand here, but she sticks to her plan. The king assures her that he will fulfill whatever she asks. Yet Esther is displaying immense godly wisdom. She is being innocent as a dove, yet as shrewd as the most cunning of all serpents. It's really something to see. Her nerves are probably just beginning to dwindle at this point. Remember, she was knowingly going into a situation where she would probably die. But now the confidence is probably growing that the plan might actually work. But she still knows that the king is an emotional cannon. He's an overly emotional man, and overly emotional men cannot be trusted. What they promise today may may even be their promise tomorrow, but if they don't have the emotional capacity to bring their promise to fruition, it does not matter. They may still lash out. They may still fail to uphold their word. They may make a grave mistake in the heat of the emotions. So Esther here has two public professions from the king that he will give whatever she asks up to half the kingdom, but she wants to lure him even deeper. She is playing the long game here, which again is likely not easy for her at all. He again offers half the kingdom. The temptation to be done with this whole thing is probably at an all-time high, but she's not convinced it will bear the fruit she knows must come if she is to stand on God's righteous principles and laws. So she bridles her body. She controls her emotions, and she answers with verse 7. Then the king answered, My wish and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. End quote. Innocent as a dove. Esther isn't blowing smoke here. She's not trying to be deceptive. She has sinned in many ways throughout the story, but meekness has been a persistent character trait since we first met her. She has a humble and quiet spirit. She's had it the whole time. Her words are genuine. Notice the way she phrases this. My wish and my request is if... She's already been offered the kingdom, up to half the kingdom twice, and she still prefaces with great meekness and humility, if, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if, doubling down in her meekness, and her lack of arrogant presumption, like the loud women of our day, if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Humble, meek, quiet, not presumptuous, and even more, hospitality. Now, as I've said over and over throughout this series, sin begets sin. Sin begets sin. If you don't kill it, it's not going to just go away. There'll be more of it and more of it and more of it. But on the flip side, righteousness begets righteousness. Pastor Ronnie cited That text on the covenant, obedience to God's law bears good fruit, and disobedience bears bad fruit, bears the cursings. Love is patient and kind. It does not insist on its own way. It is not envious or boastful. And here we see, therefore, the love that Esther has for her people. 
her father Mordecai, and I think her husband as well. She is being patient and kind. She's not insisting on her own way. She's not being boastful or envious. She knows the king's patience, though, will not last forever. Remember, she's being wise. And so she asks just for one more meal, one more meal, and then she promises to make her deeper desires known. Esther here, to use some normal terminology, is really walking by faith. She believed her father, who said the Jews will be preserved one way or another, which of course was only said based upon the promises of God. Mordecai wasn't trusting in nothing when he said that the Jews will stay, they will be preserved. Haman will not accomplish his plan to kill them all. But Mordecai prodded Esther based on that, And asked her that great question. Perhaps you, Esther, have been placed here for such a time as this. And of course, we know she was. We know from this story as a whole that God's providence is behind every little detail of this life. Even when he might seem silent. Yet we also know that there are real consequences to sin. And a real responsibility upon us to walk by faith and obey the Lord. To pursue that which is true, good, and beautiful. Esther does not sit idly by trusting as she trusts in the sovereignty of God. Rather, she trusted in God's sovereignty and acted in accordance with that which is true, good, and beautiful. We know this is how we are to live. Calvinists should be the foremost people of prayer and hard work. We serve a sovereign king, don't you know? Sovereign over it all. Why else would we pray if he cannot do something about anything? We pray because he is sovereign. And he can actually do anything he pleases. That's why we go to him in prayer. We work because he is sovereign. He is the Lord over everything and he has called us to work. We don't sit back and let the time pass us by trusting that it's all going to work out in the end. It will whether we join or not. But he's put us here for such a time as this. We take ownership of the role God gave us, knowing full well he has predetermined the end from the beginning. His word says it many times over. Knowing full well it is the greatest joy and opportunity in all the cosmos to play even the smallest of roles in this grand story of redemption. Our God is not a God of black and white stories. He doesn't cut to the chase very fast. He doesn't gloss over details. No, he writes the most epic of stories, which all point to the truly epic story of God's redemption of all the cosmos, of every last beast of the field and bird of the air, of all his people. And not just his redemption, but also, as we even read in the psalm already this morning, the destruction of all those who hate him. Chief among them is the dragon himself, the evil serpent, who is crushed through the seed of the woman according to the plan of God. That seed being Jesus Christ, who is crucified, as Acts chapter 4 says, at the hands of lawless men, acting according to their desires, but also according to the predetermined plan of God. So that sinners like you and I may be saved, and God might be both the just and the justifier. Could God have just had Haman never be born? Could God have just had Haman not get this far in the kingdom? Perhaps he could have just had Esther text the king on a smartphone. Hey, can you please not fulfill Haman's commands? Could he have kept the edict to kill, destroy, and annihilate all the Jews from going out in the first place? Yeah, he could have. He could have, but he didn't. And we should do nothing but appreciate the story he has written in history for us. Could he have created a world with only golden retrievers? A world without bats or spiders that dingle down, land on your head when you don't want? Without sea monsters, as Deacon Jonathan said this morning, quoting Leviathan and Job. A world with without man-killing animals like hippos and lions. 
Could he have created a world with only roses or a world with food but no taste buds, eyes to see but no color spectrum, ears to hear but no music? Could he have created a world where sin did not enter? Yes, he could have. And it would have been a world without grace, without mercy, without redemption, without perseverance over trial and temptation. It would have been a world without Christ crucified. The day our Lord died on that tree is in the sovereignty and providential plan of God, both the most tragic day in all of human history, and it is also the most glorious of days. As Jesus Christ died and atoned for sinners like you and I. Without the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we have no resurrection from the dead. If sin did not enter the world, we could possibly have had a feast with God. We would not have died at all, but it would not be the wedding feast of the Lamb. It would not have been one founded upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, the very power of God unto salvation. We would know nothing of those attributes of God in any way, shape, or form. Listen, church, like Esther, you have been all granted speaking roles in this story. You have been put here for such a time as this. God is sovereign over it all, yes, like a master artist who places each little pebble in swipe of the pen or the paintbrush in his art purposefully. But this does not negate your responsibility to act in faith, taking God at his word, to serve him courageously with joy. We must all ask ourselves, who are we in this grand story of reality playing out each and every day? When it's played out before you at the end of time, who will you have been? The complainer? The adulterer? The crook? Are you the liar? The ungodly feminist or cowardly man? The person who thinks they know better than God and is always critiquing God's word? his prophets and apostles. This story will be played out for all of us to see. You may think you do things in secret, but there are no secrets before God. As the catechism that we ask our children questions, where is God? The right answer, he is everywhere. And all things, good and evil, will be brought to the light eventually. So who are you in this story? Who will you be when the story is all over? I know you were once a sinner. You were once the character that no one liked, or at least they wouldn't have liked if they truly knew you. But in Christ, by grace and the power of the Spirit, Christians live redeemed lives. We have all the tools at our disposal with the very Spirit of God in us to live redeemed lives. We go from living like normal Persian pagans idolizing comfort, to redeem followers of God, risking our lives, picking up our crosses for glorious reasons, glorious things, epic proportions in this story, for things that are truly honorable, pure, and good. The Christians are those who stood with the king, for the king, by the king, the true king, who offers you all not just half his little puny Persian empire, but all the inheritance that he has given his very own son, Jesus Christ, he offers it to Christians. He offers it to Christians. Which in this whole world, which in this whole story is the whole world, to the farthest reaches of the cosmos, that is what Christ has rightly earned in his perfect obedience to the Father, and he has given it all to us on the cross, dying for our sins, receiving the inheritance for his perfect life, and gives it to us in receiving the death that we deserve for our sinful life. He offers not half the kingdom, but all of it. So serve him. Serve him, dear Christian, the sovereign king. Serve him in your life each and every day, each and every hour. May your story be one of redeemed service to the true king, like we see it becoming Esther's. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we confess that up to this point, we have been idle. We've often been foolish. We've often lived according to what we all thought was right in our own eyes. 
We fail to submit to your scripture as you speak. We fail to cherish your scripture as the lamppost that leads us to the celestial city. We fail to cherish the gospel that is in accordance with the scriptures. We fail to proclaim it on mountaintops that sinners like us might be saved to the farthest reaches of this world. We fail to worship you, whether we eat or drink. But your mercies are new. You offer us Christ even this day to help us, O oh God, to repent, to take you at your word, to love one another, to be wise, to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, to serve you each and every hour, knowing that you are everywhere. You see all things. Help us to be the character in the story that even when no one's looking, knowing that everyone will eventually see is the noble character, honorable and pure and righteous, all by grace through faith in your son, Jesus Christ, as we follow after him. Help us to do this. Give us more of your spirit that we may do this. We thank you for redeeming the world through Esther as one of the many women that the seed continued through as the Jews were not slaughtered, but by your grace, they lived. And eventually, through the seed of the woman, your son came, our Lord and Savior. We trust you, Lord, that you are working all things for our good and your own glory, even when it may not seem so. But help us in our unbelief. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.